uh, to, uh, for, for answer from the Minister. So I call first Ms Rosemary Barton. Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 1 and 7 together. Um, I am looking at future payments um, can do to support sustainable farming and our cultural landscape. In doing this, I will give consideration not just to couple payments, but to all types of support which could be available. In relation to couple payments, we have to take into account the provisions of the Northern Ireland Protocol of the Withdrawal Agreement, which will put a limit on the amount of support that can be linked to production in Northern Ireland. These limits are still to be determined, but are likely to be similar to the limits under the Common Agricultural Policy, which currently range from 8 to 15 per cent of the total allocation for a member state. There will be ongoing consultation with farmers and other stakeholders as policy is developed in this area. Mrs Barton, for a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can I just ask, while this support that has been provided gives a degree of stability for the members of the farming community. What steps are you going to put in place in preparation for post-2022 to plan for the allocation of future funding to ensure the continuation of this stability for the agricultural community? Well, the first element of, of achieving that stability is to achieve a similar amount of money, if possible. So obviously that has happened for the year 2020. And moving forward, that's what we will be contending that Northern Ireland agriculture needs. The second element of, of having stability is to identify how we distribute that 293 million, um, or the, fun, the amount that we get. I want to see uh, as much of that going to productive farms, um, as opposed to people who own large, large quantities of land but don't actually do the work on it. I want to encourage younger people into farming. And in order to encourage younger people into farming, they don't, obviously don't have large tracts of land and land banks, and therefore we need to incentivise them. So all of these things will need to be looked at, and uh, it will be for me in conjunction with the Assembly Committee and this House um, after discussion with the various um, stakeholders to identify a way forward. Call Mr Declan McAleer. I'll note the, the Minister's comments in terms of the, the couple of payments. Could he uh, indicate that the couple of payments that he is referring to would be in addition to the area-based payments as opposed to instead of, Graham Agut? Um, area-based payments will remain. Let's just be very clear about that. Area-based will, will always have a proportion of the payments. It's how we actually distribute um, other elements of that. And uh, can we reduce the amount that goes to area-based and use more of that to encourage um, production-based and encourage in particular uh, young people who want to come home um, and engage in farming. There are many young men and women across the country um, who would enjoy a farming career and they don't own the land, um, whilst there are others who own the land and don't want to farm. I want to encourage the people who want to farm, uh, not the people who want to own land. Thank you. Before we proceed to the next question, I should have said topical question five has been withdrawn. I didn't withdraw Mr Durkin's question without his permission. Um, Questions 2 and 13 have obviously been grouped, so I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Question 2, Mr Principal Speaker. With your permission, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll answer to questions 2 and 13 together. I'm keenly aware of the financial and personal costs that a bovine tuberculosis outbreak has on local farming families and businesses. I'm also extremely conscious of the large amount of public money which is spent on tackling TB in Northern Ireland each year. And I'm pleased to report that as a result of the declining disease levels, the compensation bill is expected to fall to around £18.5 million pounds this financial year. However, an overall BTB programme cost of £36 million pounds is still far too high. Therefore, implementing new measures as part of a clear strategy to reduce bovine TB in Northern Ireland is a key priority for me. Over the past couple of years, my department has been developing a new bovine TB eradication strategy in response to the recommendations made by the Independent TB Strategic Partnership Group in 2016. The Department's response to those recommendations was the subject of a public consultation from November 2017 to February 2018. The strategy proposes to reduce uh, bovine TB levels by comprehensively addressing all the recognised key factors in the spread of the disease. 
It makes recommendations covering six key areas, ranging from herd health management and research to those more complex issues, such as compensation levels and wildlife intervention, which will require public consultation and new legislation. Officials will shortly be presenting me with detailed options on the proposed strategy recommendations, which I will be considering with a view to implementing them as soon as possible thereafter. Mr Dunn. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister recognise the severe impact TB is having on the dairy sector and individual farmers who have lost high quality pedigree milk cows from their herds? And can he outline his, what is being done to reduce the risk of, con, of transmission of the disease from, from wild animals? Minister. Uh, yes, I do recognise it. And, uh, you know, I, I know farmers who have lost literally hundreds of animals. Uh, and the, the damage to them mentally um, and the stress of that is huge because many of these animals have the, their, their family line have, be, have been in the herd for, for 20 and 30 years and they've been developing those uh, genetics um, for many years uh, and excellent cows are being removed from the system but they're not removing the source of the problem. So the science is there we're able to link the TB from badgers in particular and, and other wildlife, including deer, uh, but badgers in particular to that particular type of TB. So there's a whole wide range of, of TB across Northern Ireland. We get a different source of TB in Mid-Down than you will in South Down, than you will in Armagh, than you will in Fermanagh and so forth. And you're able to link it to the wildlife in each of those areas. We have a, some very high concentrations of badgers and they have got very high levels of TB contained within them. My view is that it is the interest of welfare of both the bovine and the wildlife population to ensure that we eradicate the TB, and we are not doing that by just killing the cows. Mr William Irwin. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Uh, given, and I know the Minister is acutely aware of the situation with TB, uh, but the Minister accept that the, the test we are using today is the same test that was used 50 and 60 years ago. There are new technologies and new tests that are being looked at at the minute. Will the Minister give an undertaking that he will look into that? Uh, we are told that some of these new technologies and new tests can clear out TB at a much faster rate. Well, obviously, we are spending £24 million on the actual testing on the veterinary side of it. Um, so it accounts for a huge proportion of the money that we're spending trying to control TB. And over the course of uh, quite a number of years, that has been rising. Thankfully, it has fallen in this last couple of years. There was new measures put in place. But there's little more that can be asked of the farming community. It is for the veterinary side of it to do its bit and for the political side to do its bit. And that involves making tough decisions and maybe controversial decisions. But nonetheless, decisions which will, number one, improve the welfare of both the wildlife population, the bovine population, and at the same time will reduce the spend on the public purse. And that, to me, is the wise, wise way of, of actually dealing with this issue. Ms Emma Sheeran. I note that the Minister has um, previously stated you are considering a wildlife intervention. Can I ask if you are minded to consider a wildlife intervention similar to what is uh, implemented in the 26 counties? Well, I remember being in a meeting with Simon Coveney whenever he was the Agriculture Minister and I was the Environment Minister. And at that stage, they had only started the process. The evidence base now exists um, in the south of Ireland. It is an evidence base that we are happy to use. I actually have a preference for what is being done in the south of Ireland as opposed to what is being done in England, because I don't think it should be a widespread cull of badgers. I think it should be a targeted cull. So where the evidence base exists and the veterinary people can identify this is the source of the problem that is causing devastation in the bovine herd, then we do something about it. But where there is no evidence base that that exists, we should not be culling the wildlife. I would be totally opposed to that. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, and just with regard to the Department's response to the TB Strategic Partnership Group's recommendations to eradicate bovine TB, and given the strong opposition from wildlife trusts, conservation organisations, academics and the general public, will the Minister rule out the culling of healthy badgers? Well, essentially that's what I've just said, that <laughs> our target should be those areas where we have badgers which have been extensively contaminated with TB. And the science, the work that has been done behind the scenes would indicate that where you have had really significant breakdowns in, in the bovine herd, that whenever they've carried out the analysis on the badger population, it, is a, it has even got a greater intensity of TB. And I honestly believe, um, and I make a plea to this House, if you're really concerned about the welfare of the wildlife, why not remove the wildlife which is spreading infection on a constant basis to other wildlife? That is what is needed here. We need to deal with the problem. We have got a wildlife largely to bovine spread. It could be some bovine to wildlife spread, but we are removing the bovines. We are not removing the wildlife. It is nonsensical. It is expensive. and I do not believe it is either in the interests of the farming community or indeed environmentalists who want to see a healthy wildlife population in our country. I want to see a healthy wildlife population in our country. I have badgers on my own property and I wouldn't let anybody touch them because they don't cause problems. But two, three miles up the road, there's others who are plagued with TB, which is coming from the badger population in that area, and something needs to be done for those people. Mr Roy Beggs. I, th I thank the Minister for highlighting the problem that exists within wildlife and how TB can adversely affect wildlife as well as uh, our, our, our farmers. Uh, but can the minister advise, has there been any testing, he mentioned deer earlier, has there been any testing or consideration of testing deer herds within Northern Ireland or for that matter any wild deer that may have been uh, uh, found dead at the roadside in order to establish is this a problem within the deer community in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Obviously the deer population isn't, isn't as extensive as the badger population but they are known to be carriers of it. And, uh, I would be interested in, in, in looking at that because currently there isn't testing being carried out on domesticated deer and uh, that is a matter that I will raise with my Chief Veterinary Officer uh, and their team. Uh, I'd say one of the, the real spreaders of, of TB is actually llamas and alpacas which people think uh, they'll import and they're nice and cute. Um, however, the fact that they spit quite a lot causes quite a, a, a lot of spread of TB if they happen to have it so they can be very contagious. Uh, if they have TB. So, something to be cautious about. Mrs. Pam Cameron. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, question number three. The current Northern Ireland Waste Management Strategy <coughs> focuses on moving waste up the waste hierarchy away from landfill, and that includes recovery such as energy from waste, recycling, preparing for reuse, and waste prevention. Legislation and initiatives arising from the strategy have contributed to a significant increase in the tonnage of local authority collected municipal waste that has been diverted from landfill, especially to recycling in recent years. During 2019, the Northern Ireland household waste recycling rate surpassed 50% for the first time, which meant the EU and waste management strategy targets of 50% recycling by 2020 have been met ahead of schedule. I am determined to build on this success and reducing the amount of residual waste. The current £23 million uh, pounds Household Waste Recycling Collaborative Change Programme provides financial support to local councils to further increase recycling rates and improve the quality of recycling. To date, I have made £3.45 million available for four projects. Ideally, I would like to see waste minimised and any waste that does arise to be recycled. However, for the foreseeable future, a significant proportion of Northern Ireland's residual waste arisings will have to go undergo residual waste treatment and be sent to energy from waste facilities that extract at least some value through energy and heat from the waste. In this context, I am currently considering the strategic and long-term needs for residual waste management in Northern Ireland. Ms Cameron, for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer um, so far? Um, I know he will be aware of my ongoing um, opposition and indeed uh, the um, cross-party opposition. Uh, 
uh, to the proposed incinerator at Mollusk, and he may be aware that I have requested a meeting with him along with Newark 21 to discuss the need for any such facility. Can I ask the Minister how much waste is currently going to landfill and how much waste is currently going to Arc 21? Well, I am pleased to say that as a result of the work that has been done, the figures that are going to landfill have been coming down and coming down quite steadily. So between the 1st of October 2018 to the 30th of September 19, 26.5% of all waste uh, went to landfill, of which 264,795 tonnes are equated to that. Um, ARCS 21 share of that is 182,506 tonnes, and the ARCS 21 area is currently producing 30.7 tonnes. So there's obviously work to be done in the ARCS 21 area. If the overall level of Northern Ireland is 26.5 per cent, ARC 21 is on 30.7 per cent, there is more work can be done by ARC 21 to reduce the amount of residual waste that is in the system. Mr Cahill-Boyne. Hey, I could have thanked the Minister for his positive answer so far, but can I ask the Minister to commit to an ambitious strategy and targets for circular resource usage, recycling, and scaling up of composting in the upcoming environment strategy, and if he feels that these are the best strategies to reduce waste overall. Or well, I know the member has had an interest in this for a long time, and, and I thank him for his question, and it is something that I am totally committed to. Uh, whenever I was last Environment Minister, uh, we were recycling 30 per cent, and we were told we could not get the 50 per cent, and we brought about uh, the, the the reuse and recycle campaign, uh, which, which helped us to uh, achieve the 50 per cent that we are at now. The circular economy does seek to change the focus of waste management um, from resource management to resource efficiency, and that is something which is critical to maximise the value of the waste resource and the impact of the use on the environment. And we are promoting several initiatives that encompass the principles of circular economy, and significant work has already been done on waste prevention and recycling initiatives. Another example is the prosperity agreements that are being developed by NIEA with businesses, which promote those circular activities and resource efficiency once again, while simultaneously ensuring positive business growth and development. I call Dr. Steve Aiken. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for the Minister's comments, and he will be aware of the all party opposition there is to uh, the High Town incinerator. But the question I have for him would he commit now? unlike his predecessor, to state categorically that he will not be asking the executive to subsidise perversely the amount of waste that may not have gone to the High Town incinerator in such a way that the Northern Ireland executive would have been asked to subsidise ARC 21 for renewable heat energy that wasn't going to do any renewables, wasn't going to do any heat and definitely wasn't going to do any energy. Well, well Minister. Uh, what, what I will commit to, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, is reducing the amount of waste that goes to landfill, and we will ensure that we can continue to up that 50 per cent. The composting, as has been referred to by Mr. Boylan, has been very successful. We need to extract as much out of that as possible, and we need to narrow and narrow and narrow the amount of residual waste that exists in Northern Ireland um, to a very small, small core. Oh, Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I extend my good wishes to, to the new minister and uh, welcome his commitment to reducing landfill. Sometimes, Minister, the alternatives present their own problems, and not least in the agricultural industry. Could the minister outline for us his proposals to work with the farming industry uh, uh, to ensure? that the very high levels of ammonia and nitrates are reduced, and could he indicate perhaps has he the resources to do it? Well, more resources, please. I will always take a, a few pounds and, and help you achieve what this Assembly wants to achieve, and that is less pollution in our environment, um, a greater usage um, of nutrients uh, for the good, a greater recycling of waste for good, and a greater resourcing of, of waste uh, to produce energy. So we will do all of those things, and the more you can persuade uh, Minister Murphy to send us a few pounds, um, the easier it will be for this Minister to achieve. Mr John Blair. 
the uh, principal deputy speaker, can I ask the, the minister um, that whether he, uh, in addition to, to the, is considering rather, uh, in addition to the public interest and opposition referred to in the original question, is also considering actively the public expenditure element of the arguments around the site mentioned in question three. And in relation to that value for money consideration, is he considering the fact that, for example, Northern Ireland may not need a number of these facilities and that alternatives already exist um, in Northern Ireland? In addition to that, the structure of waste management currently Member used in local government may, may not quest. be effective. Excuse and me. also. Uh, order. The member is allowed one question. He is now attempting, I think, three. <laughs> and I think the minister. I will call the minister. I think he got the gist of what you were driving at. Minister. Thank you. In terms of the economics of it, obviously, um, outline business cases and all are, are done on these things. And it is a matter for the Department of Finance to, to review all of that. Um, but the member makes a, a, a point um, which will be considered by people, and particularly the Department of Finance, uh, that financially these things need to stack up. And in Northern Ireland, we have had too many schemes which haven't delivered and which have been very expensive to the public purse and we need to stop doing that and we need to ensure that we always spend money, public money wisely. Claire Bailey. The Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy Speaker, sorry. Um, and while it's great to hear all the initiatives about our recycling rates growing, um, could the Minister maybe talk to us? Obviously, incinerators need waste, they need to be fed on waste, but we have waste reduction targets to meet as well. So rather than just recycling or circular economies, can you give us some more detail on what we are doing to reduce our waste in Northern Ireland? Well, I, I have talked to my department and um, I've indicated that I would like to see a, a, a target in us doing so, some work on achieving a target of uh, no plastic going to waste over the course of the next five years. And I think that we need to be looking at fairly, fairly significant um, aims if we're going to actually tackle this issue. And when people thought 50% was a significant aim 10 years ago, it's been achieved. Let's achieve more. Let's achieve more in terms of um, all areas of recycling. And indeed, let's achieve more on all areas of producing waste which isn't needed in the first instance. So there's far too much packaging produced by many of these large supermarkets and other bodies. We need to reduce packaging and need to be challenging people uh, about all of the packaging that, that they are producing in the first instance. Call Dr Steve Aiken. Question number four. Minister. I've discussed the introduction of the Fisheries Bill in the House of Lords with George Eustace, MP, now Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. The Fisheries Bill provides a new policy framework to allow the UK to manage its fisheries as an independent coastal state. The bill includes provisions on access to fisheries and regulations of foreign fishing boats. In future, EU and other non-UK fishing boats will have to comply with the terms of any access agreement <coughs> that has been agreed between the EU or their flag state in the UK. The UK Government wants to ensure compliance with access conditions by extending the current licensing arrangements for UK fishing boats to foreign fishing boats as well. In this way, we can control who is fishing, where they can fish, and what they can take from our waters. During 2020, the UK Government and the EU will be holding talks about a new fisheries agreement, and this will include for any future access to each other's waters. And in that regard, I advise Minister Eustace that the Northern Ireland fishing fleet has worked hard to become the most active in the RIC, and that I expect it to benefit from any future agreement with the EU. And may I thank the Minister for his uh, re reply. Uh, I would just like you to uh, uh, ask if you've had any outline any discussions you've had with the Royal Navy, Scottish Fishery Protection Agency or the Isle of Man Government to protect our waters from foreign vessels from who could potentially be fishing in our areas from the 1st of January next year. Well, discussions with, with those bodies will, will lie with Westminster as opposed to myself. Um, but I believe that it is very important that we have the level of protection, number one for our fishing boats and for our fishing waters to ensure that people um, who are fishing and who are using um, that resource uh, that we have and that we own and are taking that resource um, are properly there and people who are illegally there are dealt with and dealt with in the appropriate manner. 
Sinead Evans. Um, can I ask the Minister if he intends to ensure that EU funding for local fishing vessels will be protected in the Fisheries Bill? And if so, can you provide details? Well, and I know that the member represents um, two fishing ports, uh, and I think it's important that we recognise what the needs of the local fishing community are. Um, the first need that they have is actual access to be able to go out and carry out their fishing, because over the course of the last 30 years, we have just seen decline, decline, decline in our fishing community. And at this moment in time, um, the message coming from the European Union is that they want to see more decline in the Northern Ireland fishing industry, because they want all of the fish that is landed uh, to go through a customs check because it's caught in UK waters and landed in the single market. They want to charge tariffs on fish that is caught in the RIC to be landed in Northern Ireland. I find that unacceptable, and I have already challenged our government in terms of how it's going to stand up to the EU, and I certainly won't be found wanting in standing up to the EU. They have pillaged and raped our waters for years, and we won't tolerate this kind of action, which will destroy our fishing communities even further than they, than they have to this point. I call Mr Colin McGrath. Uh, Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister what discussions he's had with um, his counterparts in the South in relation to shared uh, fishing grounds beyond EU agreements? I raised this with Minister Coveney, and Minister Coveney cannot speak to me because Minister Coveney does not have the authority over his own waters. That has to be done with the European Union. Um, so I wanted to, to discuss this matter with Minister Coveney, but because he is uh, a subservient uh, subject <laughs> of the European Union, he wasn't able to have that discussion. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd just like to follow up by asking the Minister, um, has he had any clarification at all to where this border is going to be in the Irish Sea? Well, given that all of the waters between um, Scotland and Northern Ireland and England and Northern Ireland are UK waters, then that will all account so you could be out 100 metres from, from the shore and catch a fish, and the EU will want you to go through a customs arrangement. But I hope that they'll change their mind, and it's just a negotiating position. Sure. I call Mr Mark Durkin, but mindful of the fact that we have about two minutes. So, Mr Durkin. <laughs> Question number five. Minister. Preparations for the UK's exit from the EU. My department's regular routine engagement um, which is conference calls, emails and meetings continued at a technical level with the dairy industry, DEFRA and DAFN. During the transition period following the UK's exit from the EU, the export of raw milk from Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland continued as previously. After the transition period under the Northern Ireland Protocol, raw milk will still be able to be exported to the Republic of Ireland without tariffs or additional checks. Mr Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for that answer. I had a wee bet with my colleague here that I could get him to say dairy. <laughs> this is obviously an issue of, of huge concern uh, to dairy farmers. I wonder if the Minister is in any position <laughs> to, 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 to give them any reassurance or confidence that, that he has had negotiations uh, with the host country and that they will continue to accept those bulk imports. I didn't take the bet, Minister? I will be perfectly honest. I don't want to see the process in the Republic of Ireland. I want to see it processed here. I want the jobs to be here. I want to see uh, milk plants in Arctic Arvin, um, which isn't very far from his constituency, actually upping the amount of, of milk that's processed there. And we have had too many large conglomerates who have moved in and bought up the milk plants in Northern Ireland, closed them down, took all of the stuff to the south of the border, and are paying the milk farmers far too little for the good product that they're producing. Yeah. Milk farmers aren't making money as things stand because we have two or three big conglomerates taking the milk off them, taking it down south, and them and the supermarkets are doing very well. Meanwhile, the farmers are struggling. I thank the member for Pondenderry for being very quick in his question. I call Mr Robbie Butler for a topical. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, a survey last year suggested 81% of young farmers believe mental ill health is the single biggest problem facing farmers today. What steps has the Minister taken to tackle this 2020 farming reality? Well, I would say to the member that it isn't just young farmers, but, it, but it's all farmers. 
um, who face the pressures, um, pressures of debt, pressures of poor cash flow, pressures which are outside of their control, such as um, the weather, and sometimes disease breakdown, which is outside of their control and transmitted to the, their herds. And it has proven to be a very pressurised industry. It's also proven to be a very isolated industry. Um, so many people are working day after day after day, and you know they only have the company of Radio Ulster or Cool FM or, or whatever, um, and they're not having um, a two-way conversation with people. So farmers operate in very, very challenging circumstances, and living in a rural area, um, you can lack contact with others. Sometimes, actually, the young, younger farmers have better opportunities because they're more up-to-date with the social media and, and, and have quite the model of the modern technology to, to engage in that. But we have a series of things, and uh, family farms and, 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 and farm focus and so forth, that offer and rural support, which, which offer support in mental health um, for people who are farmers and who are engaging in such activity and, and are facing challenges. And I'd always encourage people to look to the, these groups because they have good knowledge uh, of what is going on. And uh, I would further add that I have spoken to um, Minister, um, Minister Swan uh, to offer my support in terms of anything that I can do, not just for farmers, but for rural mental health in general, and uh, that we will work collaboratively on that issue, uh, which is something he's willing to do. Mr Butler, for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And the Minister sort of stole my thunder with my supplementary question, but could I ask the Minister to outline, would he be satisfied with the strategies that are currently in place within the Department of Agriculture for tackling uh, mental ill health and suicide prevention? I don't think anybody can be satisfied whenever um, across all of the problems we're, we're losing around one person every day with suicide. And that's what it was at the worst whenever um, the troubles were happening. It was at its worst level whenever road, road uh, deaths were taking that sort of number. And we couldn't tolerate the troubles, rightly. We couldn't tolerate those numbers of deaths on a road. So we shouldn't be tolerating those numbers for suicide. And therefore, it's something that we as a house, um, we can't solve all of this ourselves, but we can certainly help in conjunction with others um, to reduce the prevalence of this awful thing that's happening in our society. Can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with the agri-food sector about the quality regulations post-Brexit? Food quality regulations yeah, yeah. post-Brexit. Um, I've, certain, I've met uh, some sectors, but not all sectors, um, post-Brexit. And one of the things that we have discussed is the integrity of the UK market um, beyond uh, Brexit. Because ultimately, if something enters the European Union, um, then it can make all of its passage um, through that single market. Uh, and once it gets to Northern Ireland, it enters the, the sing it's, it's still in the single market, but it can then enter um, the GB market because we're part of the UK. So there's significant problems uh, in that. In terms of on, on the quality of, of materials that, that are here. I think that in certainly the discussions that I have been having is that even if uh, GB breaks away from European regulations, it will seek equivalence on, on, on these issues. Um, that isn't a done deal. Those are discussions that are taking place. But in any event, as a result of the protocol, we will be remain with, UK, or with EU regulations in Northern Ireland, so th th nothing should change. Ms Dillon, for a supplementary. Thank you very much. I'm um, just wondering what conversations you've had with the British government in relation to that, because obviously, and, and, and I'm sure you're well aware, and we can make as much politics out of this as we want, or we can be real about it, the agri-food sector is genuinely concerned about what will happen in terms of food quality. So what discussions have you had with the British government to ensure that regulations don't break with the EU regulations in terms of food quality? Well, today I had an IMG meeting with uh, colleagues from Scotland and Wales and, and national government were in attendance. And next month, we're actually uh, focusing in on that very issue uh, in terms of um, food, for example, which may have been treated with hormones or with uh, GM and so forth. Those are all issues of, that the public have concern about. Uh, and consequently, those are issues that we need to identify as, as we do deals with the rest of the world, um, that we're competing on a level playing field. Because the last thing that we in Northern Ireland need 
is produce which isn't as good as ours uh, coming in and undercutting our quality produce and um, a product which is less good uh, being offered to people as a result. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I congratulate you and welcome to your new role as well, and also welcome uh, uh, the Minister uh, back to the Ministerial Office, but uh, also to wish him well uh, as the, the Minister for Deira. Minister, you'll be aware uh, that following flooding in the North West in August 2017, many of my constituents from rural communities, in particular the Glenelly Valley, uh, faced a significant financial hardship with no form of redress or support provided to them uh, in the absence of these institutions. Now, I've had many meetings with uh, the Permanent Secretaries, Noel Avery and also Dennis McMahon, in the absence of a minister, and they assured me that when a minister is in place, funding would be provided. Can the Minister update me on what uh, action has been taken to uh, give some support to those farmers who have suffered uh, incredible losses as a consequence of those devastating floods of 2017? Well, this matter was raised with me by the Farmers' Union. It has been raised by um, other constituency colleagues um, of Mr McCrossens. And, you know, it has been indicated to me, uh, I know the, the Farmers' Union visited Glen Ellie the day after the flooding happened, and they were just astonished at the amount of, of water that was, was coming down river, the amount of damage that was done in terms of the fencing, in terms of uh, large quantity, quantities of silt um, on, on, the, on the grassland, and, and, and cho absolutely choking it that had to be cleared. And I do know that extensive um, uh, that the farmers had to carry out extensive work and, and they did have to pay out a large amount of money. At this moment in time, um, we are continuing to discuss this within the department to see if we can find a way forward. I thank the Minister for his answer. I know this is something he feels strongly about, particularly given his own background in the farming sector as well. Um, Minister, there, I, I was on the ground uh, throughout that week or that 10 days, and I have seen some of those scenes that you've described. And I, I don't know if you've seen some of the, the uh, video footage that existed, but it was uh, hugely devastating to the northwest. Uh, Minister, whenever Premark went on fire, uh, the departments here gathered rank very quickly and provided necessary funding for Belfast City Centre. The view is in my constituency that that didn't happen. Uh, and will the Minister accept that there is a clear disparity here when it comes to the North West in terms of funding for crisis such as that, particularly when you give what happened at Premark and the funds that were allocated, public funds allocated towards Premark and the crisis that faced uh, Belfast at that time? Um, I, I accept that, that people in that area um, perhaps feel abandoned, and, and I recognise that you know, they have personally picked up a lot of costs themselves w w without um, having any recompense for that. Uh, it was a natural disaster. It's something that you can't ensure for. Um, I understand all of that. I accept all of that. Um, at this moment in time, uh, it has been suggested to me uh, by the department that it doesn't represent value for money for them because a lot of the work has been done. Um, if we go down the, the, the route of hardship funding, then that's something that I'll have to make as a ministerial direction as opposed to having advice from the department uh, that I should do that. Uh, it's, that is something that I haven't um, ruled out doing at this stage. Call Ms. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The period uh, for spreading slurry opened on the 1st of February with only four suitable days, uh, dry days, to do that safely since that date. Whilst I cannot hold the Minister responsible for the weather, I would ask him if he has given any consideration to the difficulties uh, farmers are experiencing around this issue. Uh, yes, uh, I spoke to one of the contractors who hadn't been able to get out uh, last week at all. And he, he works extensively in the country at, at, at this um, as a consequence of the weather. Um, yet the month of January was an exceptionally good month. And I suppose here's me going, going on about the EU again. But anyway, they, they produced a proposal, worked with our departments, and they came up with a closed period. Blunt instruments don't cut it. We need to have flexibility, and a flexibility that protects our waterways from nitrates and phosphates getting into the waterways, because we know that they do damage. Uh, but we need to do that in a sensible and a rational way. And I have asked my officials to look at how we could amend this and how we could change it. 
um, to something which does give better account of the weather conditions. Because I've seen this happening all too often. You come to February, the next thing you have a bad spell of weather, and then that leads to animal welfare conditions. And then someone is in a position where they haven't been allowed and they've obeyed the law, the tanks have filled up, and it's too wet to go out. So they either spread slurry and do damage to the environment, or they don't spread slurry, and the animals are in an animal welfare situation. And that's not a good place for anybody to be in. Commissioner Bradley for a supplementary question. Thank you. Um, given that the Minister has suggested he is limited by nobody and master of his own destiny <laughs> on this, I would ask um, if he could give early assurances or direction to those farmers, because like he rightly pointed out, it's not just the health and safety, but the pollution risk that exists around this. So is there a timeline whereby uh, farmers could expect to hear some type of guidance? Well, obviously, we're now in the open season um, till the middle of October. Uh, nonetheless, rules apply, and people shouldn't be spreading in the conditions that we have seen over the course of the last week, and they haven't been, um, certainly that I have, I have witnessed. Uh, but as we, as we move forward, I would like to have something in, in place for the next close season so that we can actually identify a better way forward, which actually observes the Nitrates Directive in a very, very positive way, but also creates a degree of flexibility for the farming community that they can better do their job. That's going to involve a further negotiation uh, with the European Union, and unfortunately, I'm not the master of everything, uh, but that would have been very kind if, if the, the member could give that to me. Topical question number five in the name of Mr. Pat Shane has been withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Harry Harvey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an update to the House on his department's readiness for the next stage of post-Brexit trade negotiations? Thank you. Well, uh, my department and the Department for the Economy are, are the two departments that have the most public facing uh, when it comes to the EU trade. Uh, so we are working extensively on this in terms of the SPS in particular. Uh, I have to say, a lot of people talked about the, the trade between milk and, and, and between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in the run-up uh, to the Brexit negotiations. But they seem to forget that over 50% of goods that comes in of, into Northern Ireland, out of Northern Ireland um, happen to be going to Great Britain. And consequently, we need to ensure that there is no tariffs between us and Great Britain. And as things stand, that is not a guaranteed, but it is something that we should be totally totally resistant to, because it would have a devastating impact upon us if we end up with tariffs. And it's no good not having tariffs from Northern Ireland to Great Britain. We need zero tariffs between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Otherwise, it will have a devastating impact upon the consumers here in Northern Ireland and, indeed, upon business. Call Mr Harvey for a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Does the Minister believe Brexit? will offer the fishing industry considerable opportunity? I think it, it absolutely does, um, because we have a, a rich harvest uh, within our own property, within our own waters, uh, which we can use ourselves. Uh, but we, again, we need to have sensible behaviour um, from all of those people engaged in negotiations <coughs> to ensure that our fishermen um, do have the rights to catch the fish, to land the fish, and I'd hope to process the fish here in Northern Ireland uh, before going elsewhere. I believe a lot of opportunity exists for those coastal towns, in particular Kilkeel, Ardglass and Port of Bogie, uh, to create jobs, to create opportunity, uh, to support rural communities, to create jobs which for, for both men and women um, right across that sector. And I trust that those opportunities will be taken up and we'll see a real dramatic difference in those communities over the course of the next number of years, but we need people to be sensible about it. Thank you, uh, members. Time is up. And can I thank the House for indulging me? This is the first time I've ever chaired question time, so I appreciate your